So it's a truth recognized since the Greek philosophers to know thyself. But if Socrates was here today, I think he would update this to know thy DNA, or at least know thy genome, the sum of all your genetic instructions that encode us and all living things, and gives insight as to where we've come from and, and where we're going. Now, there isn't really a curriculum for this in schools. It, it's, it's not really taught yet, but it will become as important as learning arithmetic, as learning how to use a computer. And like IT, it's going to drive our economies for, for coming decades. Now, it's great to be here at the Education University because I haven't had to tr journey far. Um, if you go down the hill, walk about a kilometer into the industrial estate, go past the noodle factories, you should get this strong smell of hoisin sauce. And uh, you, when you're there, you should see this rather nondescript looking building, which is my office at, at BGI Hong Kong. Now, it, it doesn't look like much, but this is, since 2010, been part of the world's largest genome factory. If you go inside, this one room here is biology's equivalent of the Large Hadron Collider. It turns life to data at just astronomical uh, uh, rates. Um, this one room for many years has been the world's largest single sequencing floor. Now, it sounds like science fiction, but it's science fact. It's, it's happening just down the hill from here and lots of places all over the world. And we need to, we need to deal with this. Um, for our health and well-being in the 21st century, what we need uh, is genomic literacy. Um, we need skills uh, to make informed decisions. Every time we get sick, if we want to start a family, or even if we go to the supermarket and buy fruit and vegetables, we need to be prepared. We need to understand these, the consequences of this somewhat, both good and bad. Some examples. Just across the border uh, in mainland China, quite close to here, in 2010 occurred one of the world's first major cases of genetic discrimination. Now, civil servants taking their exams had genetic tests without their knowledge, and over 30 uh, people lost jobs because of really basic misunderstandings about genetics and genetic disease. In West Africa and in Brazil, these what I'm holding in my hand here is a handheld DNA sequencer. This was used in the, uh, in the front line in the fight against Zika and Ebola. They have a new model of this that actually plugs into your iPhone. The tricorder from Star Trek is actually a thing. It's actually here. In uh, we're using uh, tech technology developed at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, over two million unborn children in China have had their low coverage genome sequenced looking for Down syndrome and other genetic diseases. As this, as this new test is non-invasive, it's already prevented thousands of miscarriages. And in Hong Kong today, there's a growing number of companies offering which, what is essentially genomic fortune telling. Uh, many of them targeting concerned parents and promising them that they can provide uh, insight into their children's in, inborn talents. No field of science, no field of research has, has progressed at this rate. The Human Genome Project took about a decade and cost three billion US dollars to produce one human genome. A decade and a half on, one genome costs about the same price as your, a lot of the smartphones that we have. Everybody talks about big data, and at this trajectory, it's predicted to become the biggest big data there is, overtaking social media, YouTube. If you want to give some of your, your children and your students careers advice, uh, if they become genomic data analysts, they'll never, look for, they'll never need jobs in the 21st century. But with all this happening, Hong Kong has had different priorities, or one priority, really, money, the financial speculation and property speculation. All our eggs are in that one basket and it's, it's kind of risky, you know. We need, to, we need to try to diversify, move towards a more knowledge-based economy. And a group of us were racking our brains trying to think of ways that we could help 
help, uh, help move this. And when looking at the money, we actually had an idea, had some inspiration. If you look at our banknotes and our coins, they all have the same emblem, the, uh, the, the flower of the uh, Abhinia Blakeyana, the Hong Kong orchid tree. Now, emblems are important. They symbolize uh, a people, a place, uh, concepts and qualities. Um, on top of being on the money, you'll recognize our very distinctive five-petaled pe emblem on, on, on our flag here. Golden Bohemia Square and, and, and monuments and uh, the, the flowers, the, the Bohemia trees are growing everywhere. There's tens of thousands of them planted around Hong Kong. They're in the campus, they're down the hill, they have them abroad. They're, they're really beautiful and they're, they're blooming right now. The more we looked at our em uh, emblem, <laughs> the stranger we realized it was. And we realized that there's potential uh, genetic, genomic uh, investigations here that could help. Now, for starters, the Hong Kong Bohemia tree isn't Hong Kong orchid tree isn't actually an orchid. It's a legume. It's essentially a giant pea or bean plant with special uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria in its roots that creates its own fertilizer. People in Hong Kong don't know this, but it's actually eaten in a lot of the world. It's it's tasty. In, uh, in Thailand and Vietnam, they put it in salads. In the Philippines, they flavor stews with it. And in India and Nepal, they make this spicy achar pickles. Um, you know, how many places can say that emblem on their flag is, is delicious, environmentally friendly, and beautiful, you know? Eat your heart out, two-headed eagle of Albania. But uh, it's just... Bohemia has a very strange backstory in biology. Going back um, over a century, the, the government uh, in Hong Kong were, were trying to solve this mystery, trying to identify where this flower came from, and, and it shouldn't exist. Uh, the Hong Kong Bohemia is actually a sterile hybrid of two different and not very well understood um, uh, different Bohemia species. It's the floral equivalent of a, of a liger. And it, because it's sterile, it puts all its efforts into producing beautiful flowers and, and not seeds. It was discovered by this, this guy here, uh, Jean-Marie de Lave, who was a French missionary recuperating in Hong Kong in the 1880s. And uh, by chance on a walk on Hong Kong Island, he came across this beautiful tree with lots and lots of flowers. He took cuttings and propagated them. And so every single Hong Kong bohemia that you see is, a, is the same specimen from the same specimen. They're all clones. They're all cuttings of the original specimen collected over 130 years ago. Now, uh, hybrid genomes are, are crucial to in, in the history of civilization. The, uh, the discovery of hybrid wheat was uh, basically kick-started agriculture. We'd still be living in caves probably without, without it. Um, and most of the crops that we eat are, are hybrid species as well, which means that it's really important to study them for uh, food security, although very challenging. They have very complex genomes. So if you're trained, if you're able to handle complex plant genomes, studying cancer is a piece of cake in comparison. So you'd think with our, really, our expertise here, our, our really interesting floral history, um, there'd be a lot of scope to, 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 to do this in Hong Kong, but there's, there's been very little support. The Hong Kong government spends less on research than probably any developed country in the, you know, any country in the developed world. Um, there's no curriculum for this. There's no, there's no teaching of this. There's, there's no support for this. So bypassing the government, we were trying to think, well, other ways we could just go directly to the public, actually work with Work with, work, with the, work with citizens on this. And inspiration came from another island and another emblem that features on, on money, the Puerto Rican parrot. Um, this beautiful Caribbean parrot uh, at one point went down to 16 individuals. It was critically endangered, and there was a captive breeding program to, to, to keep their emblem alive, to bring their emblem back. And to hel help this, a genome would have been really useful but the, there wasn't any funding to do this. The government wouldn't provide money. So the researchers that wanted to do this decided to go straight to the public. They went door to door collecting money. They organized 
art shows, they even organized fashion shows. And through this, they essentially crowdfunded the world's first genome project. So if the People's Parrot, if they can do this in Puerto Rico with the People's Parrot, surely Hong Kong, we can, we can, we can do a People's Plant, right? This uh, shouldn't be hard. So this is why we launched Bahinia Genome, uh, Hong Kong's first uh, made in Hong Kong genome, uh, funded in Hong Kong, sequenced in Hong Kong, and, and assembled using uh, st training students here, for their, equipping them for their genomic future. So it's a hard sell trying to, uh, trying to get Hong Kong people to give money to a, to a science project, but we managed to raise about, uh, over $20,000 Hong Kong dollars on a, on a crowdfunding website. That was enough to start um, sequencing the gene catalog of the Hong Kong Bahinia and some of the likely parent species. And, um, but the aims of this project wasn't just to, to fund research. We wanted to actually uh, take, this to the, take this to the public, educate the public, and uh, increase everybody's genomic literacy. Um, so were we able to, to uh, distract people from their usual obsessions of you know, Instagramming food and uh, our politicians' shopping habits? Um, we thought this was a challenge, but we were, we were quite surprised. Somehow we managed to get plant genetics onto the front cover of the SCMP. Um, we were invited onto TV and radio. So, somehow I ended up on CNN talking about flowers. Um, Artists contacted us. Um, uh, this artist, Avon Lee, was really fascinated by the fact that uh, Hong Kong Bahinia is propagated um, through cuttings. So she created combinations of different uh, rootstocks and cuttings to create whole new Frankenstein Bahinia plants. Um, Ellen Pau at the Hong Kong Heritage Museum created a, a, a um, immersive audiovisual experience where you could go in a, in a room and actually visualize and listen to the, to the, to the, to the language, the, the, the genome of, the, um, of Hong Kong's emblem. This all shows that, that uh, communicating science and teaching science, it's not just people in white coats with crazy hair and, and bow ties, you know? Um, the people want to know about this stuff and, and um, Going into schools, we had a, a really fantastic response. The, the children were, were fascinated, asked so many really, really technical questions. A 11-year-old girl asked me if, uh, when she grows up, will she be able to create a unicorn using synthetic biology? I told her she will be. And from school kids up to, up to the universities, uh, working with um, Professor Stephen Choi at the Chinese University of Hong Kong, his master's students have already pretty much analyzed all of the data that we produced um, and assembled it. Um, we now need to see if we can take this to, to high schools. And there are new, e supposedly easy to use online tools that we're hoping to teach genomics using our data. So we were inspired to do all of this by, by Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican parrot. And in uh, TEDx, University of Puerto Rico recently, the uh, scientist involved, uh, Taras Alexic, was, um, he ended his talk by saying that he was really inspired, that in Hong Kong we were really inspired by his project. And watching this, then I was really inspired, and now I'm talking about this in a TEDx uh, talk, which is all getting a bit meta TEDx. But the whole point of TED is, is the communication and spread of ideas and, and, and inspiration. And this shows that the ideas and inspiration are spreading. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, a beaver, the beaver genome was crowdfunded. It was successfully crowdfunded, and to celebrate Canada's 150th birthday, a beaver genome has been delivered to them. This shows that ideas from Puerto Rico coming via Hong Kong can spread to Canada and beyond. It, it's, the, it's the the spirit of TED, really, and um, this the, the incredible dropping cost of this technology means that it's not just giant labs like my office at, at BGI that, that ha have access to this technology. Citizens can use it now. It's, um, there's a growing movement of DIY biologists using, uh, using sequencing technology 
to do things like studying the, the wildlife in um, uh, wildlife around us. There's a new um, uh, project, the Hong Kong barcoding project, uh, using an army of, of school children, of, of amateur armchair scientists to go to the different corners of Hong Kong, collect specimens and, and sample their DNA and basically map the biodiversity across Hong Kong for the first time, potentially even finding new species. The ability to, o to know thy DNA opens completely new horizons now and uh, allows us to really, truly understand why our emblems are important. This can inspire new generations of, of, of students, new scientists, armchair scientists, even artists to do things that have never been done before, see things that have never been seen before, and in a democratic way, that means we can all become community genomicists. We can all become DNA um, uh, DIY biologists. So I would encourage you all to, uh, to, to embrace your DNA and em embrace your emblems as well because symbols are important. Thank you.